So today I will be talking about uh, the Uncanny Valley, which is a, a thesis put forth by a roboticist named Masahiro Mori in, uh, believe it or not, 1970. And uh, recently the Uncanny Valley has become um, sort of a, a topic of interest within the last, within this decade, within the, actually the last couple of years, has become um, kind of more, uh, more, um, more discussed, more talked about, um, and there are some interesting reasons for that. We can kind of go into that a little bit later. Um, why it took, you know, some 30 odd years for it to sort of kick in and, and be recognized and be noticed. Uh, so we'll begin with um, sort of uh, what we have. Um, we have uh, we have an internet that delivers to us a lot of media, a lot of imagery, a lot of video. A lot of stuff and a lot of that stuff is imagery of robots so each one of these is a robot of some kind an uh, Android maybe or, or a, a toy robot or an industrial robot on the far end there and um, so each of these is a, a, a robot that's been designed by a team perhaps in a lab perhaps uh, in an industrial setting or, or, or a toy type setting or, or maybe just for research purposes and we're bombarded with all of this imagery. And um, well, you can see some of it, some of it is, is relatively benign looking. Uh, you have the Furby here. I don't know if people remember having Furbies. Um, some of it is, is definitely practical, like the industrial robot on the far end there. So that's just kind of like a multiple axis arm and you would fit sort of a tool on the end of it. It could be a uh, could be a spot welder, could be a, a picker-upper tool, could be like a pusher thing or, or whatever, or maybe a multi-purpose sort of thing. Um, and so you'd see those in an assembly line. And then some of these are sort of research projects, which you've probably seen around. So um, some of them are quite lifelike. This, this model in the, the far left corner there. Um, very lifelike representation of a human, and uh, some of them are, are kind of playful looking, sort of very robotic looking, like the, the Asimo here, and uh, some of them are just kind of creepy. Um, the, 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 the man-childs uh, here, the, something creepy, uh, unsettling about that. Um, I, I think this one's supposed to be smiling. I think that's supposed to be a smile, and, and this one too, I think they're, they're supposed to be smiling. But, but there's something a little off-putting about their representation, about their, their, their physical form and, and what they're trying to convey to us. So, and that is kind of the, the, the short of um, Masahiro's thesis is that you can almost arrange robots along, he's, when he was talking, he was talking about robots, you can sort of arrange robots along a spectrum, along a graph. And this is his graph, uh, Maury's graph. And uh, at the, 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 the x-axis, you have the, the degree of human likeness. So as you march along the graph to your right, you're increasing in the likeness of the robot to a human being. And the sort of the vertical there is the familiarity that the average person would have looking at that robot, seeing that robot. So you could, you could call that the, the, the likeness, or sorry, the um, the acceptance or the, uh, the, the comfort that the person would have with the robot or the, the, the sense of familiarity. Yes, this is an actual, sorry, yes, this is um, something I'm familiar with or no, this is something that's odd, something that's strange and I don't wanna have to uh, deal with it. Um, and so at the, the, the start of the graph, we've got the industrial robot from the, the, the previous page and that is vaguely human. I mean, it, it looks kind of like an arm, but if you, I mean, you sort of look at it here. Um, it's vaguely arm-shaped. It, the, the joints look a bit weird. It's sort of bulky around the joints, but it's, you know, you could call it an arm. It looks kind of like my arm, in a sense. Um, as you march along, so the, the familiarity with, with human likeness, my sense of familiarity with that is pretty low because it's just this industrial arm. As you march along the, the axis, as you make the object more and more human-like, your reaction to it increases favorably. So it tends to peak somewhere around 
The, the stuffed animal is sort of a humanoid type robot maybe. Um, that, that general zone is kind of, um, yeah, that general zone is sort of a, sort of, sort of a peak. And uh, so we can see from the, the, the previous picture would be something like the Furby or the, the Asimo would fit in that category. And then there's suddenly, once you, once you so these are, these are human in appearance, but there's, they're definitely not human, right? But there's that sense of there's something kind of human form about them. And as you march further along, so you make them more and more realistic, you give them realistic skin, realistic eyes, realistic ears and hair, you start to drop off, right? So they're close to human, but they're not quite there. So Masahiro, what he postulated is that the average person is going to reject that form. If your, your form is close to human, but just not quite right, it, it's, it's almost like you've gone backwards along the graph. And until you hit this kind of sweet spot where you very rapidly climb out of the valley, as he calls it, this is uncanny valley. Um, you very rapidly climb out of the valley and suddenly you have something that, oh yeah, you know, you've, you've made some slight tweaks to the form and um, the average person now accepts it as a, something that's familiar, something that they're comfortable with, something that um, they would describe as basically human. Okay, so that, that's the sort of the basics of his, his, his thesis, and I'll, I'll just quickly go along with, with visual examples here. We can kind of see how all of this fits in. Um, yeah, so at the, the, the far end, you've got kind of the industrial robot, the, the things that, that they, they aren't really human at all, but there's kind of vague human elements to them. They move around, they, they move with purpose, they're fulfilling a, a, a task or a mission. Uh, this is a, a pick-and-place machine for... Um, placing components onto a circuit board. And so it's got an arm and it can kind of grab things and put things down and it, it's populating this circuit board here. So it's moving with some kind of a purpose. Um, Roomba, you know, same thing, it's, it's cleaning your floor. You know, it's moving with some kind of a purpose. That's kind of a human type element. I mean, it's shared with a lot of animals and things, but, um, but it's something that we can recognize. And then, uh, right, okay. Same with the industrial arm. Um, moving further along the graph, we have things that uh, begin to look more human. So we got the Asimo, okay? It's, it's, it's definitely, it, I'd call that a humanoid shape. Um, it's definitely not trying to imitate a human, but it's made in the likeness of a human. And, and same with the, I mean, the Furby is not exactly in the likeness of a human, but it, it, it's kind of a compromise, I guess. You could think of it that way. Um, it, it's made to be cute, adorable, it, it speaks to you, it understands vaguely words that you speak to it. Um, it, uh, it has mood, it, um, it, it's intended to be kind of a cute little toy companion for your kids. And, and okay, so these are kind of the, the automaton versions, and those are the, the still life versions. So like the stuffed animals, they're, they're made, they're modeled after real animals, but they're made kind of more human-like. They're anthropomorphized a little bit. So our sense of acceptance of these is very high. I mean, you see videos of Asimo or, 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 or the Furby, um, and, and they're kind of cute. They're, they're, they're endearing. They're, um, they're, they're, they're something that, pe that, that people are generally happy with. And the same with the stuffed toys. They're adorable. They're, they're very cute. So we, we've kind of hit a peak in the, uh, in the graph here. And then, okay, so you've got these things that are vaguely human-like. Let's make them more human. Well, we plummet down into the valley very, very quickly. There, so these are, um, these are all kind of examples of what I would call uh, uncanny forms, or what Masahiro would call uncanny forms. Um, they're, Clearly, these three cases, they're, they're intended to be human-like. The inventors did their best to make them look human, act human, but there's something just off-putting about them. Um, so, okay, so her smile kind of creeps me out a little bit. Um, the, 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 the child, if, if you kind of ignore the, the body, that the head is almost something, but the, the, the gaps in the, 
the skin where they've just kind of, I mean, it's very practical what they've done to put this together. And, and the movements are kind of interesting to watch the video of, but just the, the, the folds, the way the skin sort of overhangs just unsettles me. Um, I, I'm not sure what's going on with her eyes, that she's not quite seeing or her eyes aren't quite in her head or something. Um, in this case, actually, her, uh, so these eyes, I think, are just glass, I believe, um, just solid glass, but these are actually cameras, if I'm remembering correctly. And so the, they're a bit dip, more difficult to, to fit into the skull and, and to make actually practical. They're not just aesthetic, but they have to serve a practical purpose. And so, you know, so I can understand why in these cases the, the forms are, are kind of falling short. But the, the, the consequence is that um, we're repulsed by them. This is what Masahiro is claiming, is that these forms, they, they, in slight, maybe subtle ways, they fall short, and so we reject them. Say, so, no, 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 this, can't, this, is, this is unsettling, I don't want to look at it. Or, or maybe I do want to look at it because I'm just so creeped out by it. Uh, and then Night of the Living Dead, I mean, he, so he, he, he puts a, kind of a lot of things into this category that aren't robots. Um, uh, corpse, zombie, so corpse if it's still, um, so you can imagine sort of like slack face, blank stare. Um, that's generally what these robots tend to look like, is that they're not really aware of what's going on. And so it, it kind of implies that maybe, you know, your thinking is maybe, maybe it's a dead body, uh, or maybe it's a zombie. Um, uh, he also put prosthetic hand in there. So I guess for, some, for, for him or for some people, the, the, the very lifelike, very realistic uh, prosthetic limbs can be uh, can be provoke that feeling of um, of uh, uh, unfamiliarity. Okay. So we move further along, and we climb back out of the valley. Okay. So we make these slight tweaks. We uh, improve the form. We improve the color, the complexion, the level of detail, whatever it is that that pushed them into the valley. We tweak those things, and suddenly there's the that sense of recognition. Um, there's some excellent, uh, I think the, the, the Geminoid, the DK uh, version is uh, particularly lifelike looking. Like that is a robot, that is, that is a machine. And I think that's pretty remarkable. I have moments where I'm just, I, I stare at it and I'm like, that, that looks very human. I'm, I'm almost fooled by that. Um, although it's an old, old, uh, old content. Um, 2001, some of the stills from Final Fantasy Spirits Within. So this is one of the, the early, um, really successful um, kind of like CG, full motion length, full motion movie CGI films that really pulled it off, I feel. Uh, there are moments, there are very uncanny moments in that film with the motion, but if you look at individual stills, some of the stills come off just perfect. Are just they're just really really good, especially for the date for the for the time which the the movie was made. Um, it was still very new in in the world of CGI, and uh, the some of the visuals are just incredible. Um, and again, some of them not so incredible. But I thought that was interesting. And just just for reference, so he uh, uh, he mentions the Bonraku puppet. Um, so this is kind of an example of of one of those puppets, as as being something that's kind of it, it's sort of halfway maybe. So it's, it's definitely in the likeness of a human, but it's not super realistic. It's almost cartoony in a way. And so, he, so Masahiro would put it on kind of this, the, the right-hand side of the valley, but not quite up to the status of a healthy person in terms of our recognition. Okay? So that's a quick tour of the valley. Um, we can take kind of a closer look. We'll, we'll sort of blow up a couple of these... Uh, couple of these images to look at them in more detail. Um, so this is the, one of the Actroid models, um, 2006. And uh, if you, what, what, what's kind of fun is actually sort of staring at some of these images and just trying to figure out what it is, what it is that, that puts you off. And for me, it's the, the, the texture of the skin is one thing. I don't know if you can tell from back there, but the skin looks very soft. It's almost plasticky. And the, the color is not quite right. 
there's something a little weird about about the color, about the, the, the texture. There are no pores on her face. There are no blemishes. Um, it, it could be she's wearing lots of makeup is something that it kind of says to me. The, um, the smile is also not right. The smile, so the lips, so in, in, in my thinking, the lips don't match with the eyes. So this is not a genuine smile, is my first thought, and it, it doesn't look right at all. Her eyes have just a very spaced out kind of look to them, and her mouth is kind of like smiling, sort of, um, but there's, there's not a match there. It, it doesn't look like she's looking at anything, and, and she has this kind of like dazed sort of, sort of impression that, that she's giving. Um, it, it helps sometimes if you cover up different parts of the body to see if that improves things or not. So if I, I can kind of cover up the eyes a little bit, but if you, you just sort of focus on the mouth, the mouth actually doesn't look that bad. It looks pretty good. Add the eyes in, the eyes are, are where the, the hang up is, for me anyways. Um, so this is a, 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 closer, a closer look at, uh, at, uh, at this one, the, the ever, ever muse, ever to muse. Um, for me, it's, it's definitely the eyes. Um, the eyes really don't make it work. I, it looks like she's almost missing eyelashes on that eye, but I think it's just the way they're closed. The eyes aren't quite looking the right way, and it looks like they're set very far into the sockets. Like there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a gap between her eyelids and the eye itself. And just from a physics, like anatomy point of view, that doesn't make sense. It just doesn't really jive right. Um, I think if, if that gap were closed, then, then maybe that would improve things. I think that would definitely improve things. Um, but again, you have a similar kind of problem. The, the skin looks like plastic, is what it is. It looks like plastic or wax or something. It's pretty good, but the, the nostrils for me are kind of a problem. Um, they don't look like they're actually nostrils. They look like holes in her face. So, anyways, yeah. Um, so that is, um, right, so, so that is the, the uncanny valley as seen from kind of the point of view of, of robotics um, and, uh, and automatons. But um, we, we also have it in, in other, other forms of media, I guess you could call it. Um, video games, this, is, this has been like a very like problem for 10, 15 years. Like as long as video games have been trying to uh, achieve that re sense of realism in the game. Um, cartoony games tend not to have this problem because there are other ways you can get around that. But the, the video games that, that try for photorealism or like a really good high quality models, um, and, oh, and, and movies too, sorry, movies as well, CG movies, um, they, uh, they, they fall short, seriously fall short. So, um, this, okay, so this, this is not a birthday. I don't know if you can see that from back there. It might be a bit washed out. This is not a birthday party I would want to go to. You look at the, the, the looks on their faces, completely blank. I mean, it's supposed to be a happy, this is from the fallout, the most recent fallout. This is supposed to be kind of a happy, you know, great party. These are all your friends. And, and they, they have this, just this really spaced out look and they're, they're clapping and it, just that whole scene is just, I find really unsettling because it, I mean, not, I mean, ignoring the context of the, the, the scene, just the looks on their faces themselves, very, very s kind of spaced out, very zombie-like, um, but then add in the context of the birthday party where it's supposed to be a celebration, it's supposed to be happy, you're supposed to be having a great time, and the two just really clash. And so it's like, it's the scariest birthday party ever. Um, but this is common fare in video games. Like this is just what people that play video games, this is the level of detail they expect, and this is what they put up with. They can kind of get past it because much of the game doesn't involve these types of interactions. Most of these games, you're shooting things or you're climbing things or you're jumping over things. Um, and so there aren't a lot of these, like, these scenes that, that need to convey a certain emotion. So you can kind of work around them. Um, so Oblivion, this is, uh, okay, this, so this is a few years before Fallout, but same problem, the, the actors' faces are very kind of almost mushy, sort of like, like starchy, maybe. Um, 
has the, the, the now what's what's interesting is they, they try to put more detail in because you've got uh, you've got a situation where there's um, higher polygon counts in, in models, uh, higher uh, larger color palette to work with, larger frame rate to work with, um, and just l more pixels on the screen. So you've got to fill those pixels with something. And so they do try to like add a certain texture to the model's faces, but if you don't add enough, it's difficult to add enough texture and make it look good, then it just looks like a whitewash across their face. And that, again, gives a sense of plasticky because then there are no folds in his face. Like you can see there's texture sort of around his eyes, but there's nothing around the lips, there's nothing in the forehead. It just looks like his face is just pulled, the skin on his head is pulled right back and, and kind of tied there. And, um, and that, that just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, Polar Express, so this is a couple years after Final Fantasy Spirits Within. Uh, similar quality of animation, uh, same kind of woodenness to the, the actors' faces or the, the CG actors' faces. Um, this scene, he's supposed to be surprised. He kind of looks surprised, but there's still, there's something not right. What they, what, what they, what they have hit on is the, um, they, what they did a very good job in is the, the involuntary eye movements that you get adds a whole depth of realism to the model, but it's not enough. Uh, real humans, they, their face flushes. Um, there are tiny muscle movements under the skin that just gently move the face in, in very subtle ways. And for the characters in this, this film to express any kind of emotion, it either needs to be designed into the model itself, so the model is designed to look sad all the time, or designed to look angry all the time. It's either designed in or it's over-exaggerated to bring that out because their faces are so wooden, their faces are so stiff. Uh, that's actually a tactic they used in um, uh, Spirits Within, is the, the main um, antagonist is designed, his model is designed to look angry. And most of the scenes he's playing kind of this angry, um, sort of nasty, evil man. And um, it's not through his acting, like the voice acting is wonderful, but it's not through the CG model's acting or how it was portrayed on the screen that conveyed that anger. It was in the design of the model. It was like he was born to be angry, which again is another sense of unrealism that they've added in there, but it's what they had to do to make it work. Um, so anyway, so yeah, there's maybe like creative ways that you can sort of get around it, but, um, but it, it, is, it is a problem if your goal is to make believable characters that you can have feelings towards, that you can em emote with, then, um, then the, 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 the valley represent, the valley is your, your, is, is your problem. The valley is, is what you need to overcome to really connect your audience with the characters. So, okay. Um, so something else that uh, Masahiro um, postulated is that your sense of unease will increase when the thing is in motion. Now, your sense of acceptance will also increase. So it, it kind of has this effect of scaling the whole graph when things are moving. And so a still may be very convincing or you know, maybe not too bad, um, but then have that thing in motion and it could ruin it completely. So I think we can take a look at a couple of videos that I think are kind of interesting. Um, we'll begin with... Okay, we'll begin with this. I quite like this one. The uh, Gemino. <laughs> Sorry about that. So this is a this is a bit of a mechanical test. Um, they they were still kind of tuning in the parameters, so it it's not a great um, it, it's not a great representation of what this technology can do in the sense of like where it could, like, like it's, be it's not his best foot forward, I guess. But, uh, but I do think it's interesting because it shows uh, just a range of expression across this guy's face. And um, let's just watch it here. Hi. 
<laughs> so, so that that I find a little bit eerie. You can you can definitely tell that it's not human. It's it still looks very mechanical. The movements are very jagged. They're not they're not smooth. Um, this system is based on pneumatics, so just pumping air basically. And they're with that they're able to get very quick, very it's very responsive system. Um, you don't have to wait for motors to spin or gears to move a thing. You can just kind of push a lot of air and, and the action happens very quickly, which a lot of human actions are like that. They happen over a very short period of time. But then there's also more smooth actions, like the way he kind of jerked his, his head around a little bit it was a bit off-putting. I don't think a human's head could actually do that. The forces are too, it'd be too much of a shock, I think. Um, and so people just don't move their heads that way. But the, 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 and the breathing was a bit heavy and they, they comment on that, that that was one of the things that they, they, they had to calibrate in. Um, so it looked like he was out of breath, but at the same time, so at the same time he looked out of breath, there, it wasn't obvious from his face that he was out of breath. He was just kind of breathing heavy. I would expect his face to be maybe pale or maybe flushed or, or to change somehow, to reflect that. But, so that was a bit of uncanniness there. Uh, the, the kind of part smile on his face, he, looking at it, he looked kind of nervous, like he, was, he was, had a little performance anxiety and there's just a little bit of a, a smile coming on his face. So, so anyways, so that was, um, I thought, kind of interesting. That was something that, right, so those are things that I was able to read into that and I felt I would feel generally comfortable sitting across from this thing. Now, other examples, we'll look at this one, CB2. Um, this one is, um, okay, so we'll look at it. So what, what is pretty cool about this one is it, it's meant to be interactive. So in the other one, they're, they're controlling it, the, the Geminoid, they're controlling it much like a, an animated puppet with these sort of pneumatic controls. This one, it, um, it has sensors around its body, around it, across its head, its, its chest, its shoulders, and it's able to react. Uh, 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 uh. Thank you. Uh, so it has uh, it has sensors around its body, so the 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 the, the, the program um, the program is able to react to stimulus and um, track movement and 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 generally sort of feel what's going on and and um, and so that gives it uh, an extra dimension of that gives it a dimension of interactivity that that was that's maybe missing from this one. Um, but at the same time, kind of creepy. Uh, the, the folds of skin, a little bit off-putting. The, the thing it did with its eyebrows, I think it was supposed to be moving its eyebrows up and down. Um, there, you can tell that there, there are motors underneath the skin, but the skin is so heavy and just so rubbery that it's not being conveyed out. Right? So the movement of the eyebrows, for example, very like kind of a subtle sort of twitch almost. But the skin is so heavy, and I, I don't think the skin is attached here. I think it's just sort of pulled over. It may be attached, I don't know. Um, but, um, but that movement wasn't conveyed. And so the human face has like, you know, dozens of muscle groups scattered across it, and the skin is actually quite thin. And so if I, if I twitch muscles or if I pull muscles, the effect is, is is very obvious, is very instant, and the skin moves in a particular way that this skin did not. So that's kind of, so that, that's kind of I guess, a good example of the, the, that, that separation that puts it solely in the uncanny valley is the, the, all of those things, the, the skin, the, the way it moved, the, the way the skin fit together. Um, right, so... This one is kind of, this one is just kind of fun. I just want to play it. Um. Very little loud. But it's, uh, it's what they call the mechanical test. So they're just, they're just playing around with the system to make it do things. And some of them look fine. You know, it's just tired. And then, oh, kind of creepy. Yeah, kind of, 
kind of okay <laughs> really creepy and and these movements okay so his face is kind of spazzing out a little bit um <laughs> i mean it's 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 comical it's it's comical it's a little unsettling they're they're not intending this to be um uh, again a, a best foot forward kind of thing but they're just sort of playing with the system and testing it out um and, and so some of those movements looked really, really good. Uh, some of them kind of unsettling. And the, the quickness, the system and the way it was actually able to move into these different poses very, very quickly is something that a human couldn't do. A human just couldn't move their head fast enough. If they did, they would probably sprain something. Um, so, Right, but, but again, it, it's, it's maybe I could see somebody doing it as uh, sort of for fun, like you're making faces at your mom, or maybe she doesn't like that, but you think it's really funny, or um, you know, you're, you're, you're just sort of goofing around. And so there's, there's enough there that it makes me comfortable. Uh, the, the sort of eyes open, mouth open was very unsettling. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that at all, but the rest of it I was kind of okay with. Um, now one more, okay, so one more trailer I'm just going to quickly play. Uh, well, it's kind of not enough time. That's fine. Okay, so I think, I think everybody kind of gets it. We'll um, go back to the presentation here. Is it six? Sorry, just give me a sec. Come on. Is it open? Oh, sorry, it was open. Okay, so those are some examples of um, when when motion helps something. I think the the geminoid looked pretty good. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a real person, but I'd call it somewhere in the comfort zone around here. Um, exaggerated by its movements, and and the the CB2 kind of pushes it for me, anyways, pushes it further into the valley. Um, as something that's kind of unsettling. So, so we've talked about Masahiro Mori's thesis, and his thesis applied specifically to robotics and robotic-like things, like prosthetic limb, um, androids, humanoids, this sort of thing. But um, I think there's a more a general concept of the uncanny that I find more interesting than that thesis. And uh, I mean, the thesis is cool, it, it, it's, it sort of gets you thinking, but then I'd like to take a step back from that, broaden it out and think about what is uncanny? What is it about that experience? Can we take something from that experience, generalize it, and think about other things in this similar sort of way? And I think the answer is yes, we can do all those things. Um, but start, so starting, maybe starting with what, what it is that we were looking at, um, we had uh, a shape or form we were presented with that was familiar, right? The form, you could say the form is supposed to be something. In the case of the industrial arm, we say, yeah, like it's supposed to be that. It's, it's doing its thing, it's building a car, it's, it's building a circuit board, whatever, but it's supposed to be a thing. In the case of, um, the robots, we would say that uh, they're supposed to be human. That is what they look like. They, somebody put a lot of effort to make them really close to human, so that's what they're supposed to be. But then at the same time, you recognize all of these shortcomings in the forms themselves. Say, well, this is the standard you've sort of set down. It, okay, so you need to be human. That's obviously what you're going for. But you've missed a few key points, like the flushing of the face which happens naturally, humans' involuntary eye movement. The, your eye tends to focus on things when you're looking around. You don't just stare blankly into space. Uh, when you're smiling, your eyes smile at the same time. Um, it's, it's the, each of the forms is missing some key or a number of key elements that would make it look fully human. And so it could be motion, it could be in physical appearance, it could be um, any number of things. But 
all of those sort of convey to you a sense of strangeness. So you're presented with this familiar thing, but at the same time, it's unfamiliar. And your mind has to sort of wrap, it, wrap itself around that to figure out, okay, well, I'm getting a, conf a conflict of information. What is going on? And it creates within you this sort of, this dilemma, this cognitive dissidence that on the one hand, yes, you're convinced that what you're seeing is human or it's supposed to be human, but it's lacking all of these human qualities. So how does the brain sort of reconcile those things? Well, sometimes it doesn't and, um, and you just become afraid. It provokes a sense of anxiety, like a, a sense of need to, okay, I have to figure this thing out. What is it? Um, it can provoke in you fear, um, maybe sadness. Um, they, it tends to provoke these negative emotions. I'd say in the case of real life, in the case of art, so you're watching a movie, you're watching the Polar Express and Tom Hanks is on the screen and you're thinking, no, nah, that just, you, that, 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 that just doesn't work. You, you, you're seeing him talk, you're seeing him smile and laugh and, and emote, apparently emote, but it's not coming off to you. So you say, well, eh, they did a bad job. That's sort of where, the, where when your mind is, is, um, is confronted with that scenario, that's sort of where it goes, is you've, you've got this art form in front of you, you know it's designed by human, you know it's supposed to look human, um, so your brain says, well, they just did a bad job. They, they did a bad job. I'm just going to reject the entire film. I'm, you know, maybe I'll still watch it, but it, it, it's, it's, um, it's not very good. So, so that's kind of a problem for artists, I think, on the one hand, is if you do have an audience that is feeling that sense of uncanny, how do you, how do you approach that? How, how do you sort of acknowledge that and, and, and work your way around it? Because you don't want to lose your audience. And the second, in, in a real life scenario, you have something that you want to be taken seriously as a human being, um, or, or let's say a robot that you want people to have um, positive feelings towards, right? I mean, if your goal is to create something nasty and monstrous, then, then this, uh, this is a great formula. But if your goal is to create something that you want to empathize with, something that you want to be comfortable around, then that also poses the same problem. You don't want people to reject it as sort of an other kind of thing. Um, right, so given that, okay, so, so given that sort of formula of... Um, of familiar yet unfamiliar circumstances. We can kind of generalize and look to other instances of uncanny in our lives. I personally find traveling to a strange place an uncanny experience. The, the place generally has streets. So it, like if I go to Montreal or Quebec or um, even back home to visit my folks in Chatham, um, the streets, you know, it, it's, it's a city, it, it has streets and buildings and things, but, so there's this sense of familiarity, but if maybe you haven't visited in a long time or, or there's enough, um, there's enough differences there, it all, the place also strikes you as unfamiliar and you're set up with this, this sort of a conflict. And I think that conflict, I think that, that sense of difference can be exaggerated if the place is culturally very different or they speak a different language, or they just look different than you. It kind of, it, it, it kind of strikes that, 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 same, um, that same sort of imbalance in what you're seeing. That you, have, you, you see a city or you see a scene in front of you, you have a certain expectation, and then that expectation is not completely fulfilled in, in a very contradictory kind of way. Um, I think, um, so that, so traveling to a foreign place, I think is, can be an uncanny situation. Uh, I think a lot of bad art is, provokes an uncanny sort of experience in the viewer. So if you've ever seen art where, um, you know, somebody has done it, just a beautiful piece, but the shadows are wrong, or maybe they've left out the shadows. So like, as I'm standing on the stage here, there's, there's a subtle kind of shadow around my feet and cast up against the wall. And that conveys to you that I'm standing on something. Like that's a big cue that you look for. And I don't know, if I see this in art sometimes where the, the person is missing a shadow or the shadow is not, maybe the light source is very close, but the shadow is very indistinct when you would expect it to be nice and sharp. Or the shadow remains sharp as it goes up the wall when it should be blurring. 
And so they're like, or the shadow is going in the wrong direction, or it's conflicting with another shadow in the same scene. Um, or maybe the, uh, the, the perspective of the scene is kind of wonky. I think all of these things convey a sense of uncanny to the viewer where they look at it and they, they see what the artist was trying to go for, but again, it falls short. And so they can't quite square that with, square what they're seeing with their expectations of what they should be seeing. And the result, I think, is to reject the artwork. You stop looking at it. You say, well, it's not very good. I'm not gonna pay money for this. So, um, right, so I think, that, so I think that's, a, that's kind of an interesting thing to recognize. Um, other things too, like I think um, weather or lighting um, can change the sense of a, a room or if you've ever seen a sunset, it can turn what was otherwise just like, like Hamilton's, um, Hamilton's shoreline, a lot of industrial and you get the burn off from the stacks and, and um, it conveys a, a certain sense of kind of industrial landscape, you know, feels polluted or dirty or whatever, you know, whatever you're feeling about Hamilton. Um, but then the same scene, I think it's kind of cool looking, but anyways, but the same scene uh, from sunset, if it's a romantic night and the stars are out and the, the sun is setting and it's kind of glowing nice and reds and purples and yellows, could be very romantic. And so it kind of transforms the scene for you, lighting does. Um, also your own emotional state. So that same scene can be something and not something at the same time. And there will be those moments where you're, you're in that situation and you kind of recognize that and it, it, it's a little off-putting. You're like, well, it was this, but it is this. How does that... And again, your brain will try to reconcile those things together. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully. Maybe you become anxious and you just leave. So it's, it's the same, let's say it's the same um, path through the... the uh, escarpment um, uh, radio, tra radio trailer or something that you take every day, but you take it after the sun's gone down. So it's the same, like physically the same situation, but the lighting is completely different. And so it provokes, it provokes this fear response or anxiety or, or maybe you find it romantic, whatever, but it, it changes it somehow. Uh, I think Halloween, it, I mean, it, it's kind of fitting that this talk took place a couple days after Halloween Eve. Um, that's kind of what that's kind of what Halloween is all about is playing with that idea in a very comfortable very sort of uh, festive sort of way the idea of changing things and the, the fact that this like this little kid your 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 son is your son one day and then he's transformed into a vampire the next day and he acts like a vampire and he um, I think is is kind of interesting that it, it's that time of year we set aside to sort of try to embrace some of those thoughts and maybe explore some of those feelings um, a lot of what, what people would call weird fiction plays with the idea of the uncanny. Um, this was much of what Lovecraft wrote, I think, plays with that idea. It um, sets characters in, it puts characters into familiar circumstances, but gives this sort of cosmic element to them, this, this element of cosmic horror or of otherness or of strangeness and and really just kind of mashes those two things together in a way that the character has to confront directly and they typically end badly um the characters are usually driven insane uh, because of their their inability to reconcile what they believe how they believe the world should be and how the world actually is they can't overcome their own expectations of that and so they go mad or they kill themselves before they go mad. And, and he does, I, I, to some success, to some unsuccess, some of his work is great, some of his work not so good. Um, but I think he, he captures that feeling really, really well, that feeling that the uncanny isolates you. It removes you from what you found comfortable and it puts you into this strange and foreign place. But at the same time, you're not, it, it's not wholly foreign, but at the same time, it's familiar to you, or it should be familiar, but it isn't. And that conflict is the real arc of the story, resolving that conflict. So, um, okay, and so to kind of wrapping things up here, um, is, so is Uncanny always bad? Um, I, I think there are, 
we wouldn't call it, maybe we wouldn't call it uncanny, but um, there are situations where you, 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 you see something unfamiliar or something out of place, and it's joyous. It's, it's, you laugh at it, it makes you happy. Uh, magic tricks always do it for me when something disappears on stage. I know that that shouldn't be able to happen. You can't make something disappear, or you can't read somebody's mind and pick out their card. Um, I believe those things, that, that those things are impossible, but when I see them, that belief is confronted. And so I'm, I'm, seeing, so I'm seeing something that's at odds with my belief, and I have this sort of like, whoa, what, what is going on there? I have these uncanny feelings, but it's in a context of, of sort of joy and celebration and happiness, and, and so they're, they're kind of like, yeah, hey, let's embrace them, let's, you know, I'm stunned, let's, let's see another trick. Um, impersonation, so uh, I can't do any impersonation, so I'm not even going to try, but maybe, you know, somebody does an impersonation of Sylvester Stallone, and suddenly they're, they're the friend that you know, but they're transformed into this completely other person for just that moment, and it's eerie, it's just kind of, it's weird, but again, it's comfortable because you know them, you're, you're comfortable with them, uh, and so it's not a threatening situation. Um, ventriloquism, same sort of thing. Um, mechanisms I find really uncanny to see like a very complex gear work, driving an automaton or driving a, a, maybe an electronic typewriter or a, a mechanical typewriter. Um, any kind of new science, I think, strikes us as uncanny. If I, oh, so maybe my talk today, I, I were to unveil this magic levitation machine. Not magic, but it, it, based on science. So this new scientific principle of anti-gravity that I found out. And I just demonstrate it here on stage and let you play with it and ride around on this little anti-grav scooter around the room. That would, for me, that would be an uncanny experience because I've never seen that happen before. And as far as I know, it can happen. So I have this really strong expectation about the world and something like that, a new scientific breakthrough would break that. So, okay, so, so anyway, so these things, we wouldn't call them uncanny, but they, they share in the same sort of experience that we would have looking at something in the uncanny valley or reading uh, Lovecraft's cosmic horror. We, we have same kind of reaction, but very different sort of outcome. And so what, what I kind of want to leave you with, and, and you can ask me some questions about it or, or just sort of think about it for yourselves, is um, what is the experience itself? And what I would say that the uncanny experience is something within ourselves. So it's, it's, a, it's an internal conflict. It has nothing to do with the thing that's being presented with us, being presented to us. That thing is what it is. So that could be an Android, could be a new hovercraft, um, it could be you know, Tom Hanks and Polar Express. That, that is what it is. It can't be anything else, but we react to it in a very certain, very strong way. We have to ask ourselves, what is the nature of that? What, is, what are my expectations here? And how are they being, so right, what are my expectations and how are they being violated? And does it have anything to do with that thing or does it have to do with me? And so this is something I was thinking about if you, extend, if you keep extending the concept, you start to see connections with uh, racism, with prejudice, with uh, cultural biases, and the sense of wrongness that people see in other people's culture or other people's way of life. Those, I think, are uncanny experiences for those people. And keep extending it further and further, and it, it starts to tap a little bit into the, the, the dark side of the human psyche. And so what I kind of like to leave you with is sort of questions and thoughts about what that means and um, what it means to feel something uncanny and what you do with that and, and sort of where do you go from there. So anyway, so I, I, I think I've, I've chattered on long enough. Um, but thank you for your attention.